now. Um, give me just a moment as we grab a microphone for you guys um, so that you can tell us a bit about your ministry. But as we watch that video to see what FaithWorks is doing uh, around the world, one of the things that I found really exciting was seeing that you guys were partnering with even local ministries and international ministries, but even Abide House, which is another ministry that we support here as a church. So as a church, we try to support missions organizations outside of just our local body uh, because we deeply want to see the kingdom of God break out all over the world, people introduced to the, both the gospel and the love that we have for them. So uh, I'd invite you guys to share with us a little bit about your vision uh, for FaithWorks. Is this working? feel a little more comfortable with a uh, camera in my hand than with a microphone, but uh, here we go. So our, our vision at, uh, at FaithWorks is really we're, we just are looking to serve the Lord wherever we can in the local community, uh, in the world really. Uh, we do uh, construction missions, we do uh, uh, children's ministry, and then we'll do uh, medical missions. So uh, this year we have, uh, you can see some of the pictures from uh, Tanzania, we were able to go there and uh, help our partners there. And we've also been to the Flagstaff Family Food Bank, uh, the Abide House, like you said. And uh, we're always looking for, uh, for ways to go and to serve. And um, the way we got involved was uh, Glenn and Jan Allen, who founded FaithWorks, were standing up in front of the church like this, and they, they put out an um, invitation to uh, come out and serve with us. And, uh, and that really struck me at the time because, you know, you see the missionaries out there, and they're, they're doing great things, and um, I'm so proud of them. And and then, but to be asked to personally go out and, and be able to go and help and serve was just a huge thing for me. And um, and I invite anybody here to to come and help us on uh, some of our mission trips. That is incredible. It's really cool the way you guys are showing such tangible love to people around the world. How can we join you? What ways can we partner with you and answer that call? Hi. There's lots of ways you can join us. First of all, just through prayer. We just want to be flowing on God's sea of prayer everywhere we go. And that would be great if you guys could help with that. Um, this brochure out on the table will tell you about some of our trips. If you can pr um, prayerfully consider going on a mission trip, that is our passion to get people to go. Get that mission heart going. Um, also, we do accept donations uh, for helping people to be able to go. Um, and also, we collect little things to take when we go, like vitamins and Beanie Babies and coloring books and glasses. Uh, so there's lots of things that you can do to help Faith work. Just give us a call and we'll fill you in. <laughs> Parkside, this is such a cool opportunity because I know we do mission trips as a church but maybe those have come up at really difficult times for you. Um, but because we're partnered with these other organizations, there are opportunities for you to be involved in mission, and we want to see you involved. So let's circle back to prayer. What are some ways we can pray for you and your organization? <laughs> anything and everything. Anything, anything and everything. that's just how the Lord's yeah. work goes. Um, we, um, oh, yeah. Um, so as you saw, we do a, a medical mission down to Me Mexico. We have a clinic that we're there involved with um, four times a year. And um, we're, we're really in need of an optometrist, uh, optician even, or ophthalmologist, one of the three O's. <laughs> and uh, we have a, a bunch of donated glasses, and we have a program for getting those prescribed and distributed. But um, we, need, we need some help, some actual professional help in that area. So prayer, prayers for uh, um, an eye specialist. Um, we also need prayers for um, our office staff. Uh, a lot of times they feel just a little overwhelmed with all the um, work that comes into the office. So prayers for them also. All right. Well, let's pray for them together this morning, but please keep praying uh, throughout the month and throughout the year for FaithWorks. Uh, Lord Jesus, we know that you're a God who provides, and it's so um, exciting when we face these challenges that we know you can provide for, and we get to uh, expectantly wait to see what you're going to do. 
And so, God, I pray that you would raise up um, the exact person they need for this eye care in Mexico, um, or even a team of doctors who are passionate about uh, serving the poor, and that Faith Works would be able to come alongside them um, and facilitate uh, um, their ministry and their ability to love people around the world, and that you would see the gospel go out in that way. Just pray for the office staff um, in the midst of a job that it's easy to go unrecognized. I pray they would feel um, the weight of what they're doing for the kingdom um, and that they would feel your peace um, as they work, knowing that you're with them and that you're helping to facilitate these things as well. And thank you for Tony and Amy. And I just pray that you bless them and lead them as they lead this organization. We love you. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing with us. All right, now we get to dive into the Word this morning, and I'm particularly excited to begin this series with you. We introduced the Minor Prophets, uh, and now we're going to get into one of the Minor Prophets, known as Habakkuk. So I know I just prayed, but because I feel very uncomfortable talking without asking God very publicly for help, do with that what you will, I want to pray again. Jesus, um, my mind feels all over the place this morning, but I thank you that your Word... um, is how you communicate to us through your spirit. So I just pray that you'd be here, and that you would communicate to us how deep and how great your love is and what that means for our actual relationship with you. Amen. So the first thing you're going to see in your notes is a circle. And this won't make sense right away, but I'm going to tell you a story that will make it make sense. In that circle, you can write Honi, H-O-N-I, Honi. Honi was a rabbi around the time of Jesus. And Honey was known for his prayer life and his walk with God. And when the area he lived in underwent a drought, now a drought is a big deal in ancient times. It's a big deal for us. But there was a time where if your cistern goes dry, there is not a way to water your fields. There is not a way to get water for your family. And if you are poor especially, there is not a way to get water at all. So in the midst of a drought, the community comes together and says, Honey, nothing, our prayers aren't working to get rid of this drought, but you're, you're this man of God. Would you go pray for us? And what Honey does is he walks out into the desert, takes a stick, and he draws a circle in the sand, and he steps into the circle, and he says, God, I will not leave this circle until you send rain. Pretty audacious. And so then the rain actually starts. And it starts to fall just drop by drop slowly. And Honey just kind of digs his heels in and folds his arms and says, God, you know this isn't what I meant. We need rain that will fill our cisterns and water our fields. And so the story goes that the rain changes and becomes this violent, pounding rain. And Honey continues. He says, God, you know this isn't what I meant. We need a gentle rain that gives life. And the rain becomes what they needed. And Honey steps out of his circle, and another rabbi comes up to him and says, if you weren't you, I'd rebuke you. Because I don't know why God is listening, but Honey, you harass God until he does what you want the way a son harasses his father. How do we talk to God in those seasons of struggle? How do we talk to God in the middle of pain, in the middle of mourning, in the middle of anguish. Because for all of us, we are going to face a lot of seasons of hurt. We're going to face loss. Many of you know the loss of a job, where you're now looking at your life going, what am I going to do? You know the loss of a dream that you've been pursuing and pursuing, and you've reached a point where you know you just have to give it up. Or you know the, 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 the loss of a relationship, a breakup, a divorce the loss of a close friend, a family member, a child. And, and it's more than just the things that we lose that create pain. It's, it's these things that just cause us constant pain. There are people here who are dealing with chronic medical issues that just don't seem to go away. And you ask God to take them away, and they don't go away. Or financial issues where you feel like you're working hard and being responsible and trying to get your life on track, but the the finances just don't seem to line up and it's this constant source of stress and it's just constant pain. Maybe you're dealing with a family that is cruel. 
or even the long-term effects of growing up in a family that was abusive. I mean, statistically, it's likely that there are people here with us who have suffered sexual assault or rape and are dealing with these emotional consequences and are dealing with pain. And the thing is, we don't tend to talk about these sorts of pain in church. But the Bible gives us a category for this kind of pain. See, see, our mindset has become one where there's, there are two ways to deal with pain. And neither, I think, is correct. But we say there is the one way of dealing with pain where you just write God off. You said you were good. You are not good. We're done. It's doubt. It's rebellion. But, but on the other side, we imagine this, this, this really good Christian who is able to just smile and trust God and soldier on. This is the person who, in the midst of our pain, says, God's going to work everything out for good. And it hurts us when they say that because it doesn't seem good. And that doesn't help. But we imagine that it helps them. We imagine that this person can just soldier on. And we want to be like them. And what happens is we land in the middle and we just shut down. And then our spiritual life begins to take on this pattern where, where we're growing for a while. We have a spiritual high. It's an incredible moment. But then something happens. And we fall and we just seem to freeze and not grow until that next spiritual high. And it's because we need to learn how do we talk to God in the valleys? How do we talk to God when, when we have conflicts that won't end, when our career is just driving us down, when, when God won't seem to free us from the addiction that we deeply want to be free from? And that is what Habakkuk addresses for us. So today we're just going to look at the first chapter. And Habakkuk, is all he's going to do is bring in a complaint to God. We're not going to see God's answer today. Next week we're going to come back and see God's answer. And then in week three of Habakkuk, we're going to see God's ultimate answer. But today we're just going to look at his complaint. And I just want you to begin to ask, am I comfortable with the way Habakkuk talks to God? So we're going to turn to Habakkuk 1. Uh, it's in the Minor Prophets, so just before the beginning of the New Testament. You might need your table of contents because it is only three chapters. In my Bible, it's only three pages. And I'm going to try to read Habakkuk's complaint in the tone that I believe that it is written. So let's hear Habakkuk's words. He says, How long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. That is why the law is ineffective. And justice never emerges, for the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. And God answers him. He says, look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded, for something is taking place in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. They are fierce and terrifying. Their view of justice and sovereignty stemmed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead from distant lands. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings. And rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. Then they sweep by like the wind and pass through. They are guilty and strength is their God. And Habakkuk replies again. He says, are you not from eternity? Yahweh, my God, my Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us? Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? You have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler, and the Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet, and gather them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad and rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For these things are their portion, and they are rich, and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? 
I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply concerning my complaint. Now, if you, if you get a little lost in the poetic biblical language, Habakkuk goes to God and he says, why do you tolerate these evil people all around me? Habakkuk lived at a time in Israelite history that was brutal. So we're going to see that his prayer, when he looks out at his brutal world, teaches us how to pray in pain and in anger. Habakkuk teaches us how to pray in pain and in anger. So he lived at this time where Israel was at the lowest that it had ever been. See, David's son, David the great king, his son Solomon did a few good things, but he also introduced idol worship. And from idol worship onward, the history of Israel was this downward trajectory until the final kings who were horrible. And Habakkuk likely wrote around the time of King Manasseh, or a little later. We don't know exactly. We actually know very little about Habakkuk. Um, he, this is the only place he shows up in scripture, so we, we can't date him and say, oh, he existed during this king. But we know what happened to Israel. We know the kind of wickedness he was looking at. See, King says of Manasseh that, I want to read it. He says, Manasseh shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem with it from one end to another. Manasseh introduced child sacrifice to Israelite worship. He sacrificed his own son to the god Molech. And when Jesus reaches back to the Old Testament to find a picture to describe hell, the picture he gives is of the place where the Israelites sacrificed their children in fire. And at times we can look at those depictions and say, that's really harsh, but I think God would reply, I'm not okay with child sacrifice. It should be harsh. But Habakkuk looks at this. He sees it happening, and he doesn't see God answering. And so he comes to God and he says, what are you doing? Why are you silent? God says, I'm not, I'm not silent. I'm, I'm actually going to destroy Israel with this other nation. And Habakkuk's response is not, oh, okay. But he goes, that doesn't make it better. They're worse than we are. If I was mad about our injustice, how, how much more the injustice of this nation that's going to destroy us? And I think often we hear such a desperate, angry prayer and something in us goes, oh, I, I'm not supposed to talk to God like that. I'm not allowed to talk to God like that. So what I want to do this morning is I actually want to look at what Habakkuk's doing. It's called lament. And lament is all over your Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And there's really two kinds that we see. The first kind is just a lament of pure grief. This is what the book of Lamentations is. It's just saying, this is horrible and it hurts and I am mourning. I'm tearing my clothes and, and putting ash on my head, and I am mourning. And so I wrote some examples of that down because honestly, that's not what Habakkuk is doing, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that kind of lament. But if, if that speaks to you, these are just some examples. Now, there is overlap. In the midst of mourning, there's almost always one or two statements where the, the author says, where are you, God? But what I want to do today is look at the laments of complaint in the Bible. These people who take complaints to God. Because if you go with me, what we're going to see is that, that the Bible gives us permission to take this pain and this anger to God. Now, it may seem a little disrespectful as we look through these Old Testament examples. If that's bothering you, I promise, hang on till the end. We're going to circle back, and it's all going to fit into our understanding of who God is. But as we look at these complaints, what we're going to see is that for the Israelite, faith was not an option between soldiering on and doubt. But when God didn't look like God, faith was to come to him and tell him that. When, when God says he's good and everything in my life says he's not good, the, the Israelite faith that we see all over the Old Testament goes to God and says, why don't you look like you say you are? You say you're good. Why don't you look good? So we're going to see that Israelite faith says when God doesn't look like God, we talk to him about it. When God doesn't look like God, we talk to him about it. And I want to start with 
the man Jacob, who will be renamed Israel. He is where Israel gets its name. And Jacob would have grown up hearing stories of his grandpa, Abraham, and the time that Abraham met God on the road. And God said, I'm on my way to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, that doesn't sound like you. Would you destroy them if there were 40 righteous people? And God said, no. Abraham said, what about 30? God says, no, I wouldn't destroy them if there were 30 righteous people. What about 20? God says, no. Abraham goes, what about 10? God says, not for 10. And who knows what God would have said had Abraham kept pushing. But there were not 10 righteous people. God destroys the city and saves those that are righteous. And Jacob grows up hearing the ta- of stories about when Abraham argued with God. And then one day a man shows up to wrestle with Jacob, and somehow he knows that this man is God. The story is very strange. But he wrestles with him all night long. He gets his hip put out of socket. And the man says, all right, you win. Let go of me. And Jacob says, I will not let go of you until you bless me. And the man says, all right, then I will rename you Israel, which means struggle, because you have struggled with God and with men. So Israel actually means struggles with God. Israel actually means struggles with with God. And this is where the Old Testament people of Israel are born, not as a people who are faithful to God, but as a people who struggle with him. And that is what we see throughout the Old, Old Testament. Either they are struggling with God or God is struggling with them. We see this with Moses in Numbers 14. Uh, there's a lot going on in this story, and I'm sure it will leave you with more questions. But what I want you to see is that God says, I'm going to destroy the Israelites and start over with you, Moses. And Moses replies, Listen carefully to how passive-aggressive Moses is. He replies, Please let the power of the Lord be as great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Looking back to the stories before him, when God says, I will destroy these people, Moses says, You told me you were slow to anger. Show me that you didn't lie. Can you imagine? Talking to God like he pretties it up with some poetic language, but, but it, that's what he's saying. He's saying, please let, show me that the power of the Lord is the way you said it was. You know, per my last email. It's very passive aggressive. But it's because Moses trusts that that's actually what God is like. For Moses, this isn't a moment of great doubt. This is a moment of great faith where he says, I might not be able to see you, but I know what you are like. And we see this all over the Psalms. There's a man named Asaph who writes several Psalms. Psalm 74, he starts, Why have you rejected us forever, God? See, that'd be a problem because God made promises to the Israelites that he wouldn't reject them forever. He says all over the prophets, I'm going to bring you back. But Asaph comes to God and says, You're not keeping your promise. Why have you rejected us forever? Later in verse 22, he says, rise up, God, defend your cause. And that's all over the Psalms, people asking God, wake up, rise up. And it's because the Bible isn't afraid of the fact that while we live on this earth, caught between heaven and hell, caught in this way where we see God's glory in creation, but we also deal with the brutality of sin, that sometimes the brokenness of this world is not going to allow us to see God. And what God invites us to do in that moment is to wrestle, is to wrestle like Jacob. See, for kids in kids' ministry, we often talk about Jeremiah, and we were even out of VBS this year where we talked about Jeremiah, and there's these cute verses where God says, Jeremiah, I have chosen you in the womb. And and I've called you, and I will be with you. But it's really funny, because what happens then to Jeremiah, who God said, don't worry, you'll be safe, I'll be with you, is he is mocked, and he is beaten, and nobody listens to him. And in chapter 15, he comes back to God, and he says, God, why has my pain become unending? Why is my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? You have truly become like a mirage to me. Water that is not reliable. Jeremiah, this this great prophet, goes to God and he says, I keep running to you like water in the desert and I get there and all I find is sand. Where are you? And for Jeremiah, 
God actually isn't very gentle in his response. He says, Jeremiah, you're going to have to choose whether you're going to follow me or not. And Jeremiah chooses to follow, and he comes back to this same point in chapter 20 where he continues to lament and grieve. Even in the book of Ezekiel, there's this strange prophecy where, where God pictures someone going through the city and marking the foreheads of everyone who sighs and groans at the wickedness around them. Another way to translate that would be those who grieve and lament. He says that those are the ones who are rescued, the ones who look at the wickedness around them and they grieve and they lament. Because what happens when we, when we lose this category to wrestle and we find that we can't just soldier on because something has happened that hurts too much, we shut down. And suddenly we're no longer allowing injustice and brokenness to affect us. It no longer affects our heart. It is actually the pain and the wrestling with God that allows God to do his work in us. And this is why, bringing this into the New Testament in Romans 8, God talks about the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer. And he says it this way, he says in 8.26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes himself for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, we don't tend to use a lot of these words, but what, what's happening here is a picture. The picture is that you as a Christian need to pray, but you can't think of what to pray. So your prayer is, ah, ah, and that the Holy Spirit with you goes, I get it. Your kids are being so rebellious right now that either you need patience or they need to repent, but you're not going to survive. I got it. I'm going to the king. And that the Spirit translates what for you is just pain. And guys, I know like when I feel anxiety, either talking or, or praying, like I can't put words together. And I get frustrated at myself because I think of myself as an articulate person. And then I just have all these sentences that just start, I, have a, I, I want to, I want, I can't. And the Holy Spirit says, I get it. I hear you. I'm taking that request to God. I'm interceding for you. I'm going to the throne on your behalf. And, and I am convinced that this means that there are times where you are going to face an option where you are in so much pain that maybe you have two choices. I'm going to either cuss God out or I'm going to shut up and not talk to him and shut down. And what we see when we see lament is that God wants relationship with you so much that he says, I will translate. Come to me. Don't stop wrestling with me. And this is where maturity begins to come in because we, we know that God is a great king. We know that, that, there is a, that, that we want to grow into the kinds of people who really can suffer and say, your will be done. But this is where we see earlier in Romans in 8.15, he says, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Over and over, the New Testament says that as believers, when we believe in Jesus, we are born again. But that we start as babies and we learn and we grow. And that maturity looks like Jesus, that a mature person looks like Jesus. No father comes to a crying baby and goes, say please, and then I will take care of you. But a father does come to a four-year-old and say, you need to use your words. You need to say please. And a father does come to a teenager and say, you need to knock it off, you know better. And for us, God in his love and in his fatherhood, meets us where we're at, whether we are at a place where all we can do is groan and whine and cuss and complain, whether we're at a place where we go, God, I know you're good and I don't see it and, and I have all these doubts and just help me with my unbelief, or whether we're in a place where God needs to say, you need to knock it off, I've shown you that I will take care of this time and time again, it's time to trust. And God in his wisdom and his love knows how to respond. And he does. We see that. We see his response to Job when Job says, you know, he, there's this crazy line where it says, though God slay me, I will hope in him, yet I will argue my ways to his face. What? But then when God shows up, Job falls down, and, and God gives like this, this long monologue where he says, does lightning ask you where it should strike, Job? Because it asks me. And Job falls down and says, I repent in dust and ashes. But God looks back and says, Job spoke well of me. God recognized that Job needed to wrestle. 
because wrestling brought Job to the point of maturity where he says, I I realized I was talking about things too wonderful for me to understand. And it, was, and it was because Job had spent his whole life walking with God that when God shows up, he goes, you know better. Similar with Habakkuk. It seems a little more gentle with Jeremiah. And, and I want to just reframe how we think about this because I don't think it's an issue of right ways and wrong ways to talk to God. Because God is your father and he doesn't want you to stop coming to him. He wants you to come, whatever it takes, and because of his spirit, he is going to move you forward until you look like Jesus, because it is in the wrestling that we learn how great God is and what obedience really costs. My wife and I had a really difficult situation where we had taken in some foster kids who really needed a good, safe home, and we had thought we would be better than we were at being their parents. But their, their behaviors were too difficult for us and were bringing up mental health issues for us. And we had to come to a point where we said, you guys can't live with us any longer. And we had started out in this journey saying, we will never be those people. <laughs> to this point of brokenness where for months I didn't want to talk to God. It just hurt. And I was trying to soldier on. I'm a leader in a church. I know God's good. I'm supposed to soldier on. But it wasn't until God brought me to a point where I could say, God, this isn't fair. It's not fair to those kids. It's not fair to us. I thought you would be there. That I was able to weep and get to a point where I said, God, I don't regret it. God, I'm I'm glad it happened. I see what you were doing. See how great you are. And it brought me to a point where I, where I looked at this and I said, if I do this again, it's probably going to hurt just as much. But now I know what it's going to cost. I think for many of us, that is this brutal and beautiful place that we get to as we mature, where we go, I know the cost and I'm in. Asaph, that man who wrote these, these psalms, he reflects on these times where his soul is bitter. And this is his reflection. Listen, he says, when my soul was embittered, When I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. He regrets the way he interacted with God. He's like, you're good. I'm like a beast towards you. Hear what he says about God and what he learned. He said, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It was in the suffering and in the wrestling that Asaph got to this point where he could say, God, you're my portion. You're the only thing I want on earth. You're the only thing I have in heaven. He regretted the way he was towards God. But I am convinced by all of these scriptures that as much as we want the easy path where by the Spirit we just get to look instantly like Jesus, we are not allowed to skip the wrestling. We are not allowed to skip over the pain. And if we try to, if we try to avoid it and walk around it, we end up in this place where we are shut down. Where we have a church faith and we try to push through. But even Jesus had to wrestle. And, we, and we, when I say maturity looks like Jesus, Jesus shows us what a, a mature and holy Christian looks like in wrestling. Matthew 26, 38 to 39. Jesus says, In taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus goes to his friends. He says, I'm so sorrowful. It feels like I am dying. Other parts of the Bible record this story as Jesus is so much stressed that he's sweating blood. And he goes to God And in this short phrase, God, let this cup pass from me. The Old Testament describes the cup of God's wrath. 
and Jesus knows he's about to drink it, and he says, God, I don't want to do it. Is there another way? But because of his maturity, because of his perfection, he's able to say, but I trust you. And for us, that is where wrestling moves us toward. It's that point where we, looking at what we may be about to suffer, say, God, I don't want to go through this. But I trust you. Because earlier you didn't seem faithful. And I came to you and I said, why don't you seem faithful? And you showed me that you were. And I came to you and I said, it it hurts and it doesn't seem like you're loving. And you showed me that you are loving. So now, as I look at what I'm about to go through, I can say, nevertheless, you're not my will, but yours. I trust you. And see, this is what happens as we learn trust. We learn to trust his logic. I, I can't understand why God runs the universe the way he runs it. I can look at things like poverty and pain and I can't understand why God allows it. But I know that I can trust him. That I trust his understanding. That I trust that he is good and that his logic makes sense. And that one day when I stand before him, it's all going to make sense. Because I know him because I'm friends with him through his Holy Spirit, through what Jesus did on the cross, I can say I trust his logic. And that is what happens when we refuse to break relationship with God, but we keep coming even when it hurts. As we learn to trust his logic, but more than that, we learn to trust his love. We learn to trust that his love is going to win. We learn to trust that he is love and that we're going to see that. The way David prays at one point and he says, my soul will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. This confidence to say, I know God and I know it's going to work out well. I think this is why God says to Job, his friend, who were trying to explain God's behavior, you haven't spoken of me what is right. But my servant Job has. So, as we look at Habakkuk, and as we see God's response, I think it is worthwhile for us to pause in Habakkuk's prayer and realize that holy men sometimes let God have it. And that God is not afraid of that, but he sees, as a father sees, that he is moving his child towards maturity, so he's willing to wrestle. And so we are free to struggle with God, not as an act of doubt where we are rebelling against God, but as an act of faith that he is a God who shows up. Guys, sometimes I think we can get to a place where we are afraid of the questions or afraid of the things that seem like doubts. But to ignore them as if God would not prove them wrong is a greater doubt than to go to God and say, I'm looking at evil and you don't seem real. But I've seen you, at least I think I have, so I want you to show up because I want to be like Jesus and I want to know you. That that is actually what faith looks like in those seasons. Faith looks like not giving up on God. So we're going to close in a song. And guys, I'll admit, this is a song that (laughs) may be hard to sing. It's actually taken from the words of Job, where Job says, though you slay me, I will hope in you. That that, that we are moving towards this place of trust in God's heart and in his love. And so, so we are going to sing these words, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. And though you ruin me, still I will worship. I will sing a song to the one who's all I need. And I just invite you, if those words don't feel true to you, use this as a time for prayer. But if you've reached that point where you're saying, I want to be like Jesus. I know it's going to hurt, but your will be done. I trust your logic. I trust your love. I trust you. I want you. I'm in. I'm all in. Then we can worship that even when it hurts, God is the one who's all we need. So you can stand with me, church.